I would like to welcome everyone to the October 9th, 2012 school board business meeting. Could we all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? Okay, are there any adjustments to the agenda tonight? No? All right, seeing none, we will move on to approval of the school board minutes. Uh, I think we can do these as a slate. Uh, first, we have the executive session Tuesday, September 11th, and the regular business meeting that followed that. Do I have a motion, please? I would move that we approve the minutes as presented in our packet of the executive session, Tuesday, September 11th, and the regular business meeting, also Tuesday, September 11th. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Um, any discussion, changes, comments? OK. All those in favor? Okay, seven out. All right, we will move on now to comments by student representatives. I don't think there are any middle school representatives, are they? Are they? No, they're, those are high school students. They're here for the. <laughs> You're big for middle schoolers. <laughs> yeah, they look like middle schoolers. They look like middle schoolers, don't they? I know, I thought they were coming. I had been given a couple of names, but I don't see them in attendance. Okay. Um, so let's go to our real high school um, reps. Okay. You're about what's going on in high school. All right. Hello. Um, so what is happening in the high school right now? Currently this week we have Spirit Week going on, which is a lot of fun. Um, the theme today was pink for breast cancer awareness. Tomorrow is neon. Then Thursday is twin day and Friday's class colors. And it's fun, and the seniors are going to win hallway decorating again this year, <laughs> says the senior. Um, we've been having some, uh, some candidates for local as well as uh, state and national offices um, co coming in and talking to mostly the senior class. We've also had a, uh, this associated with um, the AP government class, and Ted Jordan's actually been organizing a lot of it, as he normally does. Uh, I know Matt was actually involved with uh, helping uh, Angus King actually came and talked to us. We've had Ms. Dill come and talk to the entire senior class, um, as well as the candidates' nights that have been held here. Um, with We've had some, some uh, people who are running for local office come and talk to us, so it's been a nice learning experience. Um, yeah, I'll pass it over to Abby. <laughs> Um, we had Cape Fusion um, two weeks ago, yeah. and um, that was a big success. It was a lot of fun, and we want to thank everyone who put that together, especially Mr. Filio. Um, and we had Abby, can you tell what Cape Fusion was for people who don't know? Okay, sure. Um, Cape Fusion was a, just a night of a bunch of things, actually, that was held at the high school, um, and it included laser tag, which we had a huge like blow up laser, it was really fun, laser tag thing, it's hard to explain. But um, we also had four square and dodgeball, as well as a bunch of food, which was delicious. And then the most talked about, for sure, um, activity was the obstacle course in the pool, the one that's um, up during every open swim, mm -hmm. I'm told. But um, that was a lot of fun. It was a great turnout, and it was awesome. And the, um, the purpose of the event was to provide a safe place for teenagers to get together and have fun. Um, yeah, to keep a, people out of trouble event. on Saturday yeah. night. Basically. I mean, that's not really what it was yeah. advertised as a yeah, student body to. Yeah. But I guess, <laughs> sure. Okay. Also, the jazz combos have started rehearsing. Um, and PSATs for sophomores and juniors are coming up. Um, so that's, I mean, pretty important for them. Um, 
I know a couple of people are being getting a little nervous about that. Um, um, Parent-teacher conferences are October 26th and 27th. Mm -hmm. And the science team had a meet today. That's pretty much pretty much everything there is. Actually, I had one more thing. Um, the student council. I, I thought I should mention something about the student council. We're actually working to uh, just a little update. Is we're working to find, uh, still working to find dance alternatives, things like that. Um, kind of fun things. I think Cape Fusion was a, a great example of that. Um, fun things that the school can do. Uh, like social events. Also, we're trying to pass as many of our fundraiser ideas as possible uh, to the current junior class because they're kind of lacking in funds right now and they're actually going to have to pay for our prom, um, the senior prom, and they actually have less money than the current sophomore class does. Um, not through lack of trying, but uh, they, they do and so we're trying to kind of pass some of our fundraising ideas onto them. Uh, so yeah. Great, great. Thank you, guys. Um, and our middle school rep is here, Connor Thorak. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, hi, my name is Connor Thorak, and I'm a rep for the middle school student council. Uh, we have a couple of sports going on right now: uh, boys and girls uh, soccer, and field hockey and cross country. And they're going pretty well. I think the season's almost over, which is kind of stinks. But um, there are conferences, the 25th and the 26th. And there's no school Friday, and there's a dance Thursday night. And it's uh, pink for breast cancer awareness. And I think we're donating $1 towards breast cancer research. Um, there's also the book fair. We have a book fair on the 23rd by the... MSPA, and then we just finished kneecap testing, which mm -hmm. went well. Okay. Thanks, Connor. Thank you. All right, let's move on to comments from the public on agenda items. Any comments from the public on agenda items? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on to number five, communications. Um, A the 2013 National Merit Semi-Finalists. Jeff, do you wanna? Actually, guys, why don't you come on up here too, okay? I really am sorry. <laughs> 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 so, um, Nolan mentioned that PSATs are next week. Um, and it's the PSATs that the juniors will be taking next week and the PSATs the juniors always take in the fall of that year that determines um, students who are recognized across the nation as national merit semifinalists. Statistically, uh, across the nation, 1% of all students in America are recognized as national merit semifinalists. So these are, the, these are the students who score in the very top 1%. Um, so if you do the mathematics, um, we have 11 national merit semifinalists, which is an absolute, which is the highest number we've ever had. Um, and if you if you sort of carry that out, it's like the equivalent of what an average school would get in a, in a if you had a class of about 1,100 kids, um, and in the in the 12th grade, and we have a class of about 135, I think. So it's a tremendous tribute to these guys um, and to the others, um, and I've just ask them to just sort of say, just come up to the microphone and just say who they are, and then I'm going to name the other folks who aren't able to be here. I'm uh, Matt Gilman. I'm Sam Sherman. And I'm Daniel Epstein. And in addition to these uh, three, uh, there are eight others who are unable to make it here tonight because of science team, soccer, um, and a number of activities and a couple who have jobs. And those are Emma Inhorn, Francesca Governale, Ali Briggs, Travis Delano, Brett Parker, Ben Hansel, Robert Frachero, and Cam Caswell. Um, so we just wanted to bring them here tonight um, and just to briefly recognize them for what is an outstanding, outstanding accomplishment over their education all the way up through 11th grade. So congratulations, guys. Yes, congratulations.
Mary? Yes. Before they sit down, oh, they can sit down, but I, I had a couple comments to make. Okay, go ahead. Oh, wait just hey, one guys, second, you got, guys. you're going to get a compliment. You might want to stay with Yeah. <laughs> From David Hillman, you'll want yeah, I know. This. <laughs> come on, come on, Sam. You know, if you're going to get a compliment, take your coats worth. off. <laughs> Now, if I'm giving compliments, you think they would care how long I went on? You might. Um, I, become a, I, I was aware of this fairly early on because my son's a senior with these gentlemen and with, and with these ladies. And Jeff did put it in perspective how great an accomplishment this is. But I ran a few numbers. And I'm sure they can correct me when my numbers are wrong, but don't do it. Um, I want to emphasize some things that's just amazing. You, to get this, you have to have a score greater than the top 1% in this entire country. We have 11 students out of about 136, I believe it is, which is, my information tells me, is 40% more National Merit Scholarships semifinalists in this year than in the best previous year we've ever had in our school system. That's a pretty amazing statistic for this class. Also, um, if, you, if you look at the top 10% of our class, which is about 14 students, that means about 80% of the top 10% of our class are national merit semifinalists. That is unbelievable. My poor son has to compete with these people. But he does very well. So. Um, I, I have to tell you that I, I haven't, did, did not do a search, but Jeff's point I want to expand on. To have a school of our size have, have this number in its top 80% 80 become a national merit uh, semifinalists and to have this kind of a score, there is no school nationally. I don't care if it was Beverly Hills, Winchester, Mass, Lexington. I think this would compare or beat the best of the ones nationally. And I'm really proud of you guys and all the gals uh, who made this. This is an unbelievable achievement. And um, I personally, and I'm sure the entire school board, are extremely proud of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other comments, sir? Great. You can be excused now. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Okay, so let's move on to communication or to communications um, item B, which is our facilities study update. Meredith. Okay. So I'll start, and Greg is here. If you um, have some additional questions, we have. Um, seen a draft report. We don't yet have a final uh, report in hand. We're expecting to have that sometime within the next week or so, as I understand it. But as we um, and the town council looked or heard the same information in a workshop a couple of weeks ago, um, but as we've looked at the report, basically the summary is on the low end, there's somewhere around $7 million worth of capital needs ahead of us in the next 10 years, and on the high end, somewhere around $10 million. So, Again, over the next 10 years, capital needs for the school district, including community services in the pool, are somewhere in the seven to $10 million range. Right now, we're spending about, well, this year's budget is $207,000 uh, in our capital plan. So clearly, that means we're going to need to step things up a bit in order to keep up with some of our um, capital and maintenance um, needs in the next decade. Uh, the, again, the council has heard the same information, and I think what we'll be looking to do is to pull together a committee, um, a joint committee um, of both school and town folks to look at those needs and to plan out um, how to budget for them. But we, there's definitely a gap to fill. Um, I, I don't think they're particularly surprising in that a lot of it is sort of roofing systems as you look at <laughs> Just the square footage of our buildings alone, it's no surprise that um, roofs are going to come due. Certainly, um, you know, there are some facilities needs at Pond Cove in the middle school, as you look at the 30s building, for example. So no great surprises, I would say, to us, but definitely it's a significant amount of money. And um, again, while this is no surprise to this board, clearly we're underspending in our capital needs, and um, we need to plan out how to compensate for that in the next decade. Um, comments? And sure. Um, just, uh, uh, the study uh, confirmed a lot of um, the, the analysis uh, Greg and the school board reviewed around uh, about a year and a half ago when uh, uh, 
Ken Murphy was here, and uh, for those board members that weren't uh, on the board, we had a budget workshop, and the budget workshop, uh, part of it focused on capital improvements, and the board had requested a five-year uh, analysis, and um, obviously these are done uh, in large ranges, and I think the analysis uh, number we had looked at was around three and a half to four million over five years, and if you double that, that gets you to the, the seven million number. So uh, the study uh, confirmed what we knew is that, uh, you know, as buildings age, uh, your capital maintenance and capital project spending uh, increases. Uh, the, the $10 million is uh, above, that, above that range. And if you look at the gap, if you annualize it, you know, seven to 10 million is 700,000 to 1 million and we're at 200,000. And at that time, the board said, well, uh, you know, if we look at uh, the ability, uh, you know, to fund our programs and to recognize a challenging economic environment, what was kind of a, a prudent roadmap to fund the gap? And as uh, many of you know, uh, the capital, uh, pr uh, capital spending can show up in our budget in two ways. One is a line item called capital projects. Another line item would be uh, debt service. In other words, if you uh, issue a bond to, to, to fund capital projects, it won't show up in the, uh, the budget as capital projects. It would show up as a principal payment on the underlying bond. So um, if you looked at the 200,000, we currently have a bond that we're paying. It's around 600,000 a year for a, a Pond Cove in the middle school. Um, so if you look at the, the number, or even though we have 207000 in the budget, that's just for capital improvements, we have around another 700000 to service a bond for historical. So the thought was, well, that bond's retiring in 2015, so as we pay down that bond, we'll, the board discussed reinvesting or basically shifting from paying for historical capital improvements to maintaining the current assets of the school, which balances uh, you know, needs of future students with current students and paying for historical uh, budgeting. So the, the strategy was, um, and my suggestion will remain, is when that bond retires to shift that spending from historical capital improvements, which show up as a bond payment, uh, into current year capital projects. And the reason I mentioned the bond is that, um, you know, there's different ways to fund capital projects. I'm not saying, uh, you know, the, the bond wouldn't be a route the school to, uh, to consider, but just to just look at the capital improvements uh, line item is just one component of how much the district is spending on, on buildings. Um, and, you know, I think the, the draft report highlights uh, or confirms what we knew and what Greg's team had articulated. Um, at that time, we chose to defer some of the spending uh, to be, uh, you know, prudent economically and to minimize uh, to the extent possible the, the tax impact. And as you, you may know, there's some other uh, capital projects that the town is um, considering. Um, obviously, the most uh, relevant one is the library. Um, there's also road work that needs to be done. Um, so my view is, is, as one town, we can look at all these projects, um, prioritize them um, as much as possible, although I firmly believe, even if we have a joint committee that may want to prioritize them, we're elected officials to look at the needs of the school. So um, I support a, a committee structure, but ultimately it's our responsibility to provide uh, the, the funds and, and the capital plan that maintains our, our assets. So. If, um, there, uh, I'm not sure what the next step is on the forming a committee, but uh, I attended two me meetings and I'm working with uh, Frank Governale, who's the finance chair of the town, to uh, identify the scope of the committee and make sure it's in a workable fashion so the town and uh, who are elected to represent the town and the school board um, have the ability to make decisions that are, are uh, prudent for, for those uh, different buildings. Thank you, Michael. Um, that was a good overview. I know we've received a lot of questions with regard to that retiring debt, and I think you, you made a good, uh, you gave a good overview of, of how the, the CIP was planned to, um, to uh, 
sort of turn over into capital needs. So thank you. Uh, any other comments, John? I, I would just also thank you for that summary and, and, and want to just share that, um, that I, I, I agree with you, particularly in terms of the, the scope of the responsibilities of the school board in terms of managing the, the district's facilities needs and that, you know, any, and, and it's, I appreciate the town's interest in working directly with the board on all the town's facilities needs and I think that, may, you know, that makes good sense. And the town has been, historically, has been very good to the school district in terms of our facilities needs. Um, most recently, in, in, in terms of the, the high school boiler, we have a bond that's retiring very soon around the high school boiler only because of the town's generous contribution to that capital project. Um, but I think it's, I, I would just support exactly the way you characterized um, the, the school board's responsibility in terms of school facilities needs. And um, so I appreciate that and just wanted to offer my support to that thinking. David? Um, I just had a couple of summary points I'd like to make. Michael knows a lot more about this than I do, and I think he gave a great overview. But I think simply, um, and, and I just want to make sure I understand it and make sure that the public understands it. The bottom line is that although we're retiring a school bond within a certain number of years, that doesn't negate the need to spend money to do what the bond used to do. When you have aging buildings, you may pay off the bond, but because they're aging buildings, all of a sudden you have capital improvements, capital repairs, capital maintenance, and so forth. And I, I think people have to understand, because there is some information out there that somehow if we retire these bonds, uh, the schools can, this money can somehow magically be shifted somewhere else. The reality is we have as, as much, if not a greater need for revenue and monies to, for maintenance and repair of our facilities. Um, is, and, and therefore, um, I'm, I'm trying to, in a nutshell, say that the mere fact we're, our plan is to work with everybody and to try and utilize the one-town concept, but on the other hand, we have responsibility to some of the major assets of this town, which are our school system and its buildings. And we have been, in the past, uh, for a variety of economic reasons, we've had to um, forego with, uh, and do the more critical items, but we now have a great need for additional monies, um, whether it comes in the form of savings on, once we pay down the bond, or other monies in addition to there too, to pay for our capital funds. So the bottom line, I think I hear from all this, and, and which I would agree with, there is no free lunch, that when we re retire the bonds, if um, we still need as much, if not more money than what we're using to currently pay the bonds. Is that a fair statement? Simplistically enough for my little mind and the greater minds out there? Yes, that, that is a fair statement. Thank you. Anyone else um, have comments or questions or concerns? Um, I, I guess I would have to say, and I want to ask you, Michael, <clears throat> I think I'm right in, um, and believing this is our job is to um, take care of the school buildings and the property and that the town is asking us to uh, do this work, uh, do the work and of looking to see what needs to be done and then fighting for the fact that we need to put um, funds into our school so that the school is, um, it's an asset to the town. And so, this is our this is our one of our jobs that we have to do. Um, so it's not we want to work with the town, but I also want to make sure I go into this process knowing that this is my obligation is to fight for um, the schools so that the buildings are taken care of for the future for mm -hmm. the future. Right. Right. I'll just add. I mean, you know, the town did fund this study, and I appreciate all of Greg's time and effort on this behalf, but I think clearly with the intent that absolutely these are resources and assets that belong to the town as a whole. And obviously the job of the school board as elected officials is to 
look out for the schools and to protect school assets and to maintain them for future use. Um, so, you know, clearly that is your sincere obligation and, I, and I, I do believe that the town wants to work collaboratively with us on this process and I think that makes sense, you know, as, as you look ahead fiscally five to ten years, we want to be in sync as we coordinate budgetary needs and, and try to line up dollars and revenues and attract major projects like roads and buildings. Um, so, one thought that I had and I shared this with Mary would be that perhaps we utilize the October workshop. Uh, meeting to review um, the draft report. Well, it won't be a draft. It should be a final report at that point. Uh, but to review the facilities study so that you have an opportunity to ask questions and understand the information that's contained within that report, um, sort of ahead of the work of a committee so that the board, so that the committee representatives understand um, the concerns of the board as a whole. And Craig, will you, be, will you provide us with a summary of what you feel are the priorities and... Okay. And do you have a sense at this point about, you know, sort of five years out what we're looking at in terms of capital improvements that are necessary? And do you want to come to the podium? And we'll talk more in our October meeting. I just wanted to... Thank you. That was my question. Oh, good, good. I think Meredith categorized it correctly is that we do have a seven to ten million dollar need. And as we look at the retiring debt and what we need to cover, those things start to build up. And to give you an example, like the boiler plants at the middle school, they're currently 18 years old. They're coming to the end of their useful life expectancy. So in five years, we should be looking at replacing those. Those will be detailed in there and what priority they have. So like a boiler plant there might be a th priority three, which means in the next five to seven years we really should be replacing that. And we should be able to manage our funds enough so that we are ca carrying that in our CIP budget. So when that five, seven year point hits, it's in our CIP and we get our, our boiler replaced, our boilers. I just have one more clarifying question, and pardon me if it seems elemental, but so the current bond that we are paying upwards of six to six hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars, those are for um, capital improvements to the school system that have already been done, and we're just simply paying off the interest and principal on those. Yeah, there's different. There's a group of bonds that are actually called capital projects bonds, and then there's. Uh, the bond I was referencing is from 1994. It was for the uh, Pond Cove in the middle school. So therefore, okay. you know, physical hard assets, um, you know, that, you know, like David said, if you build a building when the bond's paid off, you, you know, the, the next step is to, to maintain the building. So, um, you know, I was just referencing. So when, uh, you know, I was, frankly, I was asked, you know, by several voters, uh, you know, why is our capital budget, how can it be only $200,000? And I explained to them the reason and the rationale. And one hope of the town, as one town working together, is to lay out a seven to 10 year plan and dedicate as, uh, funding to, to, to meet that plan because it's one area where, um, you know, you can always defer, well, let's do the roof next year. But as uh, the town and the schools both have been deferring capital projects. So rather than get to a point where, you know, this one would have this impact on taxes, where this one wouldn't, is to say, well, wait a second, what are the overall needs for the town, including, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a school, the library, town, what are the overall needs? And to, what, what's a reasonable amount we need to be um, allocating to those needs? And then the town and the library and the school would say, okay, how, how, what, which ones should be prioritized? So it's, it's to, uh, to use my McGovern's turn to, you know, put them in a logbox sort of to say, you know, we have to make these investments, we can't keep deferring them. And, and that's, um, you know, what we've known and we have a plan. So um, fortunately, we're, we're on a path, but just to make sure uh, people know that, you know, the capital improvements, we're spending more than $207,000 a year. It's just the largest chunk of it was an investment that was made in 1994 that we're, we're paying off today. Uh, actually, yeah, John. I have a question for you, Greg. Um, sure. When we replace the boiler in the high school, um, the, that was actually a cash flow positive 
project because the, the boil, those boilers were 42 years old when they were replaced. And they were so inefficient relative to the, the system that was put in place that the energy savings, if I, my recollection is correct, the energy savings was greater than the cost of the, the um, maintenance of the debt. Um, so it was essentially cash flow positive. So do, as, we, as the engineers looked at the facilities, did they take that kind, did they look at opportunities for that kind of project as well as um, projects that, such as roofs and so forth that may you know, just have to be done? Did they, did they look at where we might produce budget positive um, results by making investments in efficiency? And I know you, I've, you've done a ton of work on this kind of issue in the Alternative Ener Energy Committee and probably lots of other places. Well, when you look at things like what can have a payback, just a few years ago we did all the lighting. Now they brought into this that we could update the lighting even more and get a payback. The problem is we're at that point with some of our things that the payback is very difficult. The boilers, for instance, at the middle school would have a payback, but not as great as the payback was at the high school. We, you know, we were projecting about thirty-nine to forty thousand dollar fuel cost savings, and and we did meet that goal. Actually, exceeded it because of the warm weather, but that replacing the boilers at the middle school will have a savings of energy consumption but those are much newer boilers than they're 18 years old not 42 years old so the amount of energy savings is going to be there but not enough to make it a positive cash flow or a, a positive result from that at this time um, if we could get something like natural gas into the community that would also help us to have a much better payback on things like new boilers at the uh, at the middle school, in Pong Cove in the middle school, it's one plant. So those are things that we hope in the future might happen, but we do need to look at um, those replacements because of life expectancy. Roofs, unfortunately, they just age out. We have roofs from 1988 on our buildings right now, and the average life expectancy is between 15 and 20 years. So we're on the 25, 24 to 25 year mark at this point. So. <laughs> We're on borrowed a time on some of those areas, and we do identify those as a much higher priority need. So I'm hearing you say that, 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 that the opportunities may be dwindling for the same kind of payback that we've seen in, in lighting. I think you guys saved, your team saved $3,000 a month in, in electrical bills by changing light bulbs in all the school bills. It was amazing to see that number drop. Um, as a result of that effort. And so you're saying that there's fewer opportunities for there that are. kind of payback, but did, they, did, the, did the engineers who did the study, did they look at where those opportunities still are, even if there may be fewer? In, in those pieces of the study were more of an overview of looking at, we have a heating plant, we know that the efficiencies of replacing that heating plant will have a payback, but we didn't get into saying, okay, if you update all of the lighting in the buildings again, you will be able to pay back this. And primarily because we have hit some of that areas already. And what we're looking at, things like a boiler plant at Pong Cove in the middle school, does have a payback, but it doesn't have that, you know, real quick payback because we aren't looking at the same type of thing that we had at the high school. They overviewed it, but not to the level of do this and this is our payback. Okay, thank you. And I think in part that wasn't the specific <coughs> request Mission. made of that, yeah. of that group, in part because of the work that's been done by the Alternative Energy Committee and because we already have some of the systems information locally, it was more useful to us to just get an understanding of the total needs of our facilities sort of from stem to stern across the, across the district. Okay. Anything else from anyone else, David? I had a quick question. I'm slightly confused, and it may be my own fault. It's not for you, Greg, so you can. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> although you constantly confuse me, but that, not this time. Thank you, David. Um, we're we're going to have a meeting to discuss it. I, I guess I'm confused between the one town concept, which I fully support, yet I have fiduciary duty to maintain the schools, and the interrelationship between the library, the town's needs, and the school's needs. I would love to work them all out together, if possible, but at some point we have to do what we have to do, what we're elected to do. But, so this meeting that we're going to, this workshop and or this committee, how, 
how are we going to coordinate our independent duty to the schools with also a desire to have all aspects of the town work together? I mean, My thought about the workshop is that it's an opportunity for the full board to understand the detail contained in the facility study so that you as a full board have a sense of the big picture and that it will then be the job of the committee, which right now I think the, the view is, and, and Michael uh, was there for that meeting with the town council as was Mary, but I think the view is that that would be a joint committee, smaller group, so a couple of board members, a couple of town councilors, Greg, you know, whomever else, Michael McGovern and I, um, would sit together to look at the full scope. So to look at the town needs, the school needs, and talk about how do we prioritize the spending for these, how do we budget for these, which projects could be chunked together so that we have a 10-year sort of consistent expenditure plan, or there may be some fluctuation, but so that we are able to hit all of those needs across the 10 years. Does that help you? Yes, it does. And I just, I think that's going to be an extremely difficult task for us to all try to interrelate our capital needs with our own independent duties to our own constituencies. It's a, I mean, I'm sure we'll be able to find a lot of overlap. I hope we do, and a lot of consensus. But at some point, that's a very difficult job for that committee. It just it, it, and part of it, uh, how, how long is that report? Two hundred and I forgot. It's at 360 pages right now. Right. So, so the, the the thought was to you know hand that size report to the, every school board member and um, town council. It would be challenging. So it's really to say uh, holistically, here's what the needs are. So, in four years, when there's a you know new school board members, there's a reference. Here's you know comprehensively for the town of Cape Elizabeth. Here's what the needs were. Obviously, you know, the town council and the school board will ultimately decide, uh, you know, through annual budgets to fund, but you have assets that have long-term lives, and we do annual budgets, so what's happened is some of, there's been a disconnect. So the, the committee isn't going to say in, you know, 2018, you're going to spend X dollars, but, you know, based on this report, you know, the average life of the assets, here's some guidelines, so it would be a kind of a, a reference document in town, uh, and voters could look at it. It's a comprehensive view of all the needs of, of Cape Elizabeth. So, um, you know, if the school at some point says, you know, we need to do a bond offering, they can look and see, well, here's all the priorities for the town, so I can make a decision on, is this a, uh, is this a priority? I think, David, it's not that different from any of the other committee work that we do in that, you know, we, we, we appoint a couple of members of the board to a committee. They go and do and, you know, dig, dig deep into the details of the work of that committee and then, and then ultimately come back to the full board um, with their recommendation to the board and the board has the opportunity to ask questions and, and, and so on and so forth and, um, and then eventually choose to support or not to support the work of the committee. I think that's a good explanation. So basically the committee is to try to work up a common plan to the extent there can be one, but ultimately the decision authority allows the town council for its and us for ours. That seems like a very reasonable approach. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Anyone else? Thank you, Greg. You're welcome. We'll look forward to uh, seeing you later this month and hearing more. And how how soon will you get that report to us? It's 368 pages. <laughs> we have it. Good. Okay. Edit away. <laughs> yes, please. Feel free. Yeah, I have a red pen right here. <laughs> Great. Okay, so if there are no other comments or questions, we will move on to the superintendent's report. Great. Thank you. I'm happy to announce that all of our schools, although you just heard from uh, Connor Thorek that we are in the midst of kneecap testing, the middle school is just wrapping up and Pond Cove will be wrapping up soon. We finally received our adequate yearly progress information and all three of our schools uh, made AYP. So in other words, they met the federal um, and state requirements for adequate yearly progress. Um, so that was good news that came last week. I also brought some information to share with you about class sizes. I know that was a request that had come in, and I had previously shared with you that at um, 
Pond Cove, we were over by one student in our, four of our six first grade classrooms, and that remains true today. We are also over by one student in two of our six uh, fourth grade classrooms. So again, uh, uh, Kelly's here, but I, I think we feel like we're managing just fine within those pieces, and you know, those guidelines were established to give the board some general boundaries, but not they're not absolutes. Um, but certainly if we felt there were specific concerns, we would bring those to your attention. Um, at the middle school, we have 33 classes that exceed the class size guidelines. And at the middle school, um, the cap is 22 students per class, according to our guidelines. And we have um, eight classes of 25 students. Um, and the others are either 23 or 24. But of those 33 classes, 21 of them are in allied arts. So health, PE, art, um, computer. So those sort of courses that sometimes have a couple of, of additional students just because of the way the schedule um, works out. We have um, five science classes in eighth grade that have um, 24 or 25 students in them. We have a couple of math classes, um, in one in seventh grade, two in eighth grade, and one or two in sixth grade. I'm looking now. I can't read my own writing. <laughs> Don't tell. Um, one, one in sixth grade um, of 23. So again, a very small number of the core academic classes that exceed. We also had two world language classes at the middle school of 23. So uh, I think fairly evenly distributed and close to the range. At the high school, we look both at um, the number of classes that exceed the guidelines, but also um, because of the nature of high school, we also try to take a look at um, sections where we have fewer than 10 students. And we have of 238 total classes, so let's think about the scheduling of the high school for a moment. Um, of 238 total sections, we have 25 that have more than 22 students, and most of those are um, honors or CP classes, so it's um, somewhat intentional in that respect, and only three of those um, classes are um, really ninth grade or majority ninth grade classes, which are physics classes. So, um, you know, again, I feel like we're in pretty good shape. Certainly, we'll be monitoring um, those numbers, and, and physics is one that was right on the edge, I think, this year and, and kind of down to the wire. On the other end of the 238 sections, we have 34 right now that have fewer than 10 students, and of those, 25 are instructional support classes. So, again, you're looking at a very small number, nine classes that, that are fewer than 10, um, and uh, three of those nine are remedial. One um, is, is an enrichment course, a music theory course that's been offered. One was really just a scheduling issue, and the other four are classes that um, we kind of watch for patterns over time. So they, that they traditionally run right on the edge. One of those that we looked at last year was choral music, um, to refresh your memory, and um, drama. Um, so that's the class size information. Thank you, Meredith. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will share with you that we have um, a teacher at the middle school who is soon to be out um, on maternity leave, and that's Tabitha Eastman. So a substitute has been um, secured for her, a long-term sub. She'll be, um, she's requested about nine weeks, so within the allowable Family Medical Leave Act um, period. And the other piece I wanted to share with you um, it's just a reminder, and I think every household in town should have received one of these today, but I'm sending some more along. <laughs> I have one. Oh, you can have more. Please take some. Share them with your friends. Here you go. Um, pass them out. I have more. Yes, I'm just <laughs> distributing them. Um, but on October 16th, and I'll hold this up. Uh, from 6.30 to 8 in the high school cafeteria, we'll be holding a forum to develop or begin the development of our strategic plan. Um, so it'll be really exciting. I'm hoping for a good turnout. I did make a pitch to the seniors uh, who were in attendance at a candidate forum last week, and I'm, I'm sending some invites out to other students as well. I'm hoping for a good faculty turnout and a great community turnout, so please help spread the word. 6.30 to 8, and we will have some light refreshments available for people who don't have time to grab dinner. Um, before they come out. 
And then finally, um, I shared this information with the board, and I believe uh, middle school families heard this news last Friday, but our middle school principal, Steve Connolly, has submitted a letter of resignation. Um, Steve has been offered the position of superintendent of schools in uh, North Berwick, Berwick, and Lebanon, Maine, and he will begin his work there in early January, possibly a little sooner. I think the current superintendent there who's an interim is, is anxious to get to Florida before the snow flies. So um, right now the um, plan is that Mr. Connolly will leave, um, will not return after Thanksgiving. So I was able to meet with the middle school faculty today just to talk about a search process, and I appreciate um, those folks who stuck around today to chat with me. Um, right now what we're envisioning is really a two-phase process. So initially we would look for an interim middle school principal who would serve um, in that capacity through the end of the school year, um, ideally to begin right around Thanksgiving, um, but we'll, we'll see how that works out. I did tell the middle school faculty that if we couldn't find someone right away that I would be glad to spend my time in their building until we're able to have someone on board. So I'm not sure that that was good news for those who were there, but they smiled. Uh, <laughs> and nodded. Indulgently. Yes, okay. Um, so that would be the first phase, which I, and I would envision again that that would be a small group of faculty probably working with me to review applications for the interim position and selecting an interim candidate uh, or an interim hire. And um, then the long-term process would be to find the permanent replacement, so to begin work July 1. And uh, typically you want to get out kind of early in the ball game when you're looking for strong candidates. And um, we were very fortunate last year in our search process, uh, but we would hope to get an advertisement out in mid to late January and begin a search process similar to the process we went through for the Pond Cove principal this past year, so including uh, school faculty members, community members, school board members, and um, I would facilitate that, another administrator from within the district, and hopefully we'd have someone hired by March and ready to work for us in July. Uh, I will tell you that the middle school faculty is looking for an interim candidate in, in general that, that will avoid icebergs, which I thought was a metaphor that was important to share with you today. Um, but but you know, I, the ideal candidate would be someone who has some experience working um, with students um, at the middle level, who has an experience as a school administrator, and who's going to be able to help um, maintain the good work that's been going on at the school and support um, faculty, students, and families, and um, be able to sort of collect and share information with the permanent um, principal once he or she is hired. Okay. That's that about the end of my report. I, I did also have the opportunity to attend the Cape Fusion event with Mr. Shedd, and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next one. It's great to... Um, you know, for me to be able to spend some time, although I didn't personally try the swimming pool obstacle course. Uh, I, I did have the opportunity to see several students uh, on board there, and um, it was a nice turnout and a really fun event. Um, so, thank you for, um, yeah. <laughs> Not that great. So, I'm hoping they'll have some other events next time around. Yes. So that reminds me to thank you, um, Meredith, for all of the events that you attend. And you're around a lot. Um, you're very visible and thank all the other chaperones as well who attended. Um, we need those chaperones to host these these wonderful events. So I hope there'll be another Cape Fusion soon. It sounded like it was a hit with every grade, which is a hard thing to uh, to have things appeal to young kids and or, you know to the ninth graders and to the seniors. Speaking, I, I was just reminded by of one other item that is coming up, which is the Pond Cove uh, Parent Association Scarecrow <gasps> event. I love that. So <laughs> I'm so glad to hear you say that, that, Mary, because um, <laughs> no, next Monday, next them. Monday afternoon, <laughs> <laughs> anyone looking for some scarecrow job. fun is welcome to join me here at the town hall yes. to put together a, a scarecrow. So. Just put that invitation out there for those of you looking and for some afternoon again? fun. That will be Monday, Monday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> There's a deadline to enter, correct? That's it. That it's Monday. I believe in deadlines. Okay. Okay. 
Meredith, um, Cape Fusion is that was a grant that was proposed by by uh, C well by, uh, it was a grant. Oh, it was proposed by Aaron Filio, but was supported yes. by uh, CIF. And so, uh, again, um, there were some CIF uh, representatives there, but great support from them in, in really getting this initiative off the ground. And is it, was it a one-time? Um, or I think it goes every once a month is what I... We'll see, so but it is intended to be a series of events. Okay. Um, and hopefully we'll gain some momentum and be sustained throughout the year. That's great. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Maybe I'll chaperone next time. <laughs> <laughs> or make the brown. I guess the same look, and I volunteered. Right, right. For my daughter. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we will move on to item number six new business. Item A consideration to approve the proposed World Affairs Council Model UN trip to the University of Connecticut, November 8th through 10th, 2012. Do I have a motion, please? Yes, I move that we approve the proposed World, Affair, World Affairs Council model UN trip to the University of Connecticut, November 8th through the 10th, 2012. Do I have a second? Okay. Um, do I have any questions, comments, concerns? Well, I have a concern. There are two adults going with 19 children or 19 students. Um, that to me sounded... Um, I think that's general. Is that general? Jeff? That's generally what? Yeah, I think the school board guidelines are going for high school. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And this teacher has done it. I can't remember her name. Ms. Hall. Thank you. I've, okay. been, I've been to a couple of model events with her, and she's really responsible. So. Okay, so not, she can handle 19? Definitely. They can handle 19? Great. Well, of course, because they're... Who's going to with Her husband. Okay. Luckily, yeah. Thank you. Okay. 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 All those in favor? 7-0. Item B, consideration to approve the following staff nominations for the 2012-2013 school year. In the middle school, we have just one, Paul Casey for a .5 FTE um, language arts and social studies teacher. Do I have a motion, please? I move that we approve um, Paul Casey as a .5 FTE language arts social studies teacher for the 2012-2013 school year. Do I have a second? Okay, we'll say Elizabeth. Okay, um, any questions, concerns? All those in favor? 7 no. All right. Um, item C, I think we can consider as a slate. Um, item C is consideration to approve the following co-curricular staff nominations. Um, and uh, these are online for anyone watching. Um, uh, do I have a motion, please? Yes, I move that we approve the co-curricular staff nominations uh, for the high school as listed under item uh, C in the agenda packet. Okay, Mike. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Um, any questions, concerns? Oh, David. Just a comment. Uh, for the audience, um, we seem to raise these nominations and quickly vote on them, but I want people to realize that we receive a substantial amount of material on all these people, and we have an executive session where we discuss it at length with Meredith. So it may seem like we're just robotically approving these, but it is in no way robotic. It, uh, we have done a great amount of due diligence uh, as has Meredith and, and the various committees and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I just want that noted for the record, although I do support this. Okay. All right. Um, all those in favor? Okay, item D, consideration of the following policies for first reading. Um, John, do you want to tell us a little bit about those? There's no vote for these, but... Right, so there's... No need for a motion here, but as, um, as uh, school board uh, meeting fans are well aware, the policy committee is, um, is um, making its way through a, a review of the um, substantial uh, set of 
district policies which govern our schools. Um, uh, with the help of uh, Ann Chapman from Drummond Woodson, who is um, assisting us to review first, uh, first of all, the the um, those policies that are required by law, um, and so we have been making um, changes to those policies, um, guided by uh, Meredith and the district leadership team, um, and bringing those changes to the board, and um, this. Item D is a slate of policies that are before the board for first read, uh, which means that the board has an opportunity to look at them um, and um, ask questions about the changes that are proposed and, and, um, and we'll actually vote on them at our November board meeting. Um, I just want to add to that that many of the changes that have been made are suggestions by Wood Drum and Woodsum. Um, mostly reflect changes that have occurred in Maine state law. So we're, the majority of changes I would classify as um, just bringing our policy up to modern legal standards. That's a great point. Thank yeah. you. We're, we're, yes, that's true. We're not, we're not g generally setting out to redefine how the, the, the district does business. Um, but it's better to say that we're bringing our policies into compliance with the law or to make them consistent with the law. Thank you. Any other questions about the policies? Okay. So you'll see these again next month in your packet and we'll vote on them next month. And we will forewarn you that you're likely to see an additional packet. You'll see this same packet. <laughs> Um, back for second read. I just moved it here. So you'll see this same packet back for a second reading, but you'll also likely see another packet for first reading of some additional policies. So we will do our best to get those to you as early as possible after the policy committee, committee meeting. But um, my thanks to Andrea, especially because there's a lot of proofreading and editing and um, labor intensive work involved in just turning some of these around. So um, we'll, we'll do our best to get them out in a timely manner. Thank you, Andrea. We want them to come out correctly Great. Thank you. Um, we'll move on now to item E, consideration to approve the following job descriptions. And there is a slate um, in your packet under item E. Looks to be about 20 job descriptions. We went over these in workshop uh, in September. So do I have a motion to approve? Um, the job descriptions as listed. Yes, you, uh, I move that we approve the following job descriptions uh, listed under item 6E in the packet. And just to give the public a flavor, uh, it's uh, principal of elementary, athletic administrator, uh, community services adult programs coordinator, head custodian are uh, four or five of the uh, 10 to 15 job descriptions listed in the packet. Do I have a second? Okay, Elizabeth. Um, any questions? David? Yes, I, I spoke to Meredith about this uh, briefly. Um, I thought they were all fine, except they did not have a clause that I think is very important to have in all of them. And the question is, is always, does it go in here? Does it go in the, the contracts? Does it go in the union contracts? The answer is probably all three. Um, I mentioned it to Meredith, and, I, and Meredith can speak, but I think it's very important to have as a require, job requirement in the job description as well as the other ones that the person must be in, at all times in compliance uh, with all school board and district policies and procedures as well as all federal and state laws, rules, and regulations. Uh, we all assume that's true, but it really is it's stated apparently in these sorts of things, and it should be. Um, and I mentioned it to Meredith, and Meredith had a very good answer for me. If she can remember it. It might have been good at the time. I'll do my best. Um, so David had raised this point at our workshop session, and I inquired both of uh, some area superintendents as well as of Ann Chapman, our labor consultant at Drummond and Woodsum. And um, the consensus was that really no one has this per se in job descriptions at the moment, but 
that doesn't make it a bad idea. Um, and so I, I appreciate David's point. We have this batch of job descriptions in front of us. Um, I, I do think it, it, may, it makes something that we all take for granted very explicit, and that's not a bad thing when you're um, dealing with policy. Certainly, um, it is the practice of our building administrators to review um, particular policies as required by law with staff. We certainly have updated staff. Um, last year's policy change, for example, on staff conduct with students was one that we wanted to spend some time with staff um, or discussing with staff. We update all new, po all new employees on district policy and procedures, but I think it's worth putting in the job descriptions and I would support um, David's addition. Okay, so do we need to make an amended um, motion then? Um, I would be glad to uh, restate an amended motion um, and see if I can do it. Um, I move that we uh, consider, uh, we move that we approve the job descriptions attached to our agenda as item 6E, subject to the addition of language uh, to the effect, um, as drafted, may be drafted by Meredith and legal counsel, to the effect that, um, that there will be an additional requirement of compliance with all school board and district rules and regulations and policies as well as state and federal law rules and regulations you know I appreciate you making that but I'm, th I'm sitting here looking and thinking there's a motion on the table now that we should probably have withdrawn prior to actually, actually under Ro Rogers rules I'm okay go ahead she's <laughs> Roberts, maybe? Roberts rule, sorry. Roger. If it's a friendly, if it's a friendly amendment, the original uh, proponent of the motion may accept it as a friendly amendment. Okay, are you guys going to Are you going to be friendly, John? Sure. <laughs> Michael? I will, I will Bill. Um, I, I accept uh, David's uh, amended, or, yeah, it's, fr what do you say? <laughs> friendly amendment. I, I accept the amendment. Okay. Um, does Elizabeth have to accept Elizabeth, that as well? How are you feeling, Elizabeth? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, everyone. Um, any questions? Uh, I, I just have, I have one small concern about that, uh, that approach, uh, at the risk of belaboring this point, which is just that this is a policy that, this is a, a a clause that governs all all district employees and whenever we have something like that a clause which governs all district employees I'd rather put it in a policy which governs all district employees than to repeat it over and over again in, in inside of individual job descriptions which to my mind ought to contain ideally just what's unique to that job and because and the reason I say that is it just becomes very um, it becomes cumbersome to keep all of our job descriptions, for example, consistent with each other with these kinds of things. I know that um, historically the, the members of the previous board policy committees, or uh, sorry, HR committees, spend extraordinary amounts of time um, bringing some consistency to our job descriptions. Um, and we would sort of begin that process all over again. And, and, and so to my mind, ideally, Anything that was universal would be dealt with in a place where it could be, you know, that you could have a single statement universally applied. And, uh, but I don't think that's, you know, I'd, li I'd, li I'd like to move these forward rather than maybe belaboring it too much. But that, that's my concern about it. Do you want me to address the concern or should we just vote? Because I have a simple answer or we can just vote. No, I mean, this is a public meeting. Um, public the simple meeting. answer is that you can't do what you say. The problem is you have a, a, a conflict between contract law and school board policy. If it's not in a contract, which job descriptions are usually incorporated into a contract, or it's not in the union contract, the fact we have a policy it leaves the person may not be contractually bound to that policy unless you specifically state that somewhere. You don't want to have a problem with an employee who says, I've never read the policy or whatever. When it's in their job description, they've read it. When it's in their contract, they've read it. This is the standard way to do it. It's a simple, although I am. Then I would put it in the contract because that, that deals with, you know, there's only four or five of those. Well, actually, there's not. For every teacher, they have their own individual contract. For, there is a, quite a few number of contracts. We have a few union contracts. 
and I, I, I can assure you that it won't be effective. There, I shouldn't say it won't be effective. Actually, there is always a question of effectiveness unless you give notice, and the best way to do it is in a job description and in, and in the contract. I don't know if it's in the contracts, but this is a very simple way we might as well start it. Now, it's no different than the standard, quite frankly, the standard one sentence common language we have in all these various job descriptions, like the little bit at the bottom that says this doesn't state everything, anything else might apply. You can come up with a standard one sentence that we put in all of them. I think it's a fairly simple thing to do, and I, I urge it, period. Okay. Okay. I'm comfortable moving to vote. Okay. All right. Everyone else, any other questions? I do have one question. Okay. And I'm just assuming, or I just want to make the, the obvious statement that since we will be replacing our middle school principal, that that will be part of the next batch of job descriptions that we work on. Yes? That is correct. Um, under our hiring procedures that we talked about at the October workshop, we would be looking at that when we move to fill the permanent positions, so sometime in that December, January time frame. Terrific. Okay, great. Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? 6-1. All right, so we will move on now to committee reports. Are there any committees that wish to report? No? Real quickly, the um, insurance task force, uh, we've completed the draft um, and it's been reviewed by council of um, an RFP for an expert to be hired. Um, I don't know if I stated at the last meeting that there has been a decision by the First Circuit that allows us now to get the information. Um, hopefully that document will be sent, will be finalized for the task force within a few days if somebody gets around to finalizing it. That's me. Uh, but it's been approved by council and we're ready to move forward. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that work. That's been onerous. Okay, any questions about the, the Health Insurance Review Task Force? All right, so we will move on to school board agenda requests. Are there any requests for the agenda next month? Okay. Announcements of upcoming meetings. Meredith, you've already talked about the community meeting next Tuesday, a week from tonight. Tuesday, Tuesday. <laughs> That's right. Hello. And Six thirty, high school cafeteria. Great. But Meredith, on that for, for uh uh, people that can't attend, if they uh, could you spend just uh, a minute on um, obviously, we want everyone's feedback, but uh, maybe it would help if, if people do want to provide feedback, if we could direct them to kind of the form uh, we're looking, not the form, but you know, if they want to provide feedback, um, you know, what, what would be helpful to, to move us forward in this endeavor? I certainly would welcome any ideas, thoughts, or concerns that people have regarding um, the future of the school district. Um, there is an email address, and it's also right on here, community forum at capeelizabethschools.org. So if you're unable to attend, you can certainly send um, any ideas, thoughts, or suggestions to that address. We also, once um, all the information is collected at the forum, there will be a committee, and I've already had some responses from community members who are interested in being part of that work, uh, but there will be a working committee, and I believe I outlined this at a prior meeting, similar to the process we use for Mission and Vision, where we have some faculty members from the schools, board members, community members. Uh, um, there are some in the audience who are part of that work previously, but where that group would come together to work through all of the ideas that are generated during the forum and pull that together into a plan. So that plan would be sent out as a draft as well, so that would be another opportunity for people to provide feedback. But I, I, again, I would welcome sort of any email. Um, people can certainly call us as well, but um, the email address community forum at capelizabethschools.org is probably the best way to get information to us. But it could range from, you know, uh, I want to see X taught in 11th grade. Uh, okay, so the full range of ideas are... Full range of ideas. Okay. Um, you know, we'd like to have... Um, uh, Switch to yeah, number three pencils. an additional pencil. swing set, you know, and, uh, yeah, if we, number three pencils, I suppose. That I, would, I, I would be happy to entertain that idea, too. But, yeah, the full gamut. I mean, I, we're looking at programs, facilities... 
um, instructional needs, the, the, the big picture of what do we think we need in our schools in the next you know, three to five years. So I have a question. For those folks who are planning to attend next Tuesday night, October 16th from 6.30 to Tuesday. 8 p.m. <laughs> high school cafeteria. Snacks. Um, what, for those who are, are, are considering going, what yes. can they expect? When they, well, what type of agenda will you have for the evening? Um, so there'll be an introduction, um, probably about 15 minutes, and then we'll be breaking people into groups, roughly about 20 people in a group. We'll be working um, with members of the district administrative team to work through a protocol where you'll be asked to sort of project yourself into the future and talk about what things you see happening in our school system. And there'll be um, some opportunity to kind of work backwards to outline how did we get here? How did we reach these lofty goals that, that we identified earlier? That's exciting. I'll see you next Tuesday night. Tuesday, okay. Tuesday, October 16th. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 6.30 to 8. It's been a long day. Yeah. I don't mean to be punchy, but <laughs> I, no. re I really would love to, uh, the best news would be to have a wonderful turnout, and so that would be exciting. We should have several groups of 20. We'll be there. Meredith, who did we send? Did we send this out to all school people, community service? Everyone town. in town. Great. All the town residents Great. Great. that we know of. Yeah. Great. That's awesome. Great. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, um, we have our, uh, our workshop October 25th, is that correct? I don't have a calendar in front of me. I'm sorry, October 23rd. 23rd. Sorry, I don't have one in front of me either, but October 23rd. Okay, October 23rd, we will have our workshop, and it looks like we're going to be discussing uh, the, the facilities needs plan. So... Um, We'll see everyone there. So may I have a motion to adjourn? I move that we adjourn. Okay. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Seven. Okay. Thank you.